you. Uh, it's really exciting to be back here. Um, I look around this room and I don't really know anybody except for those that I've, uh, that I've met this week. Um, what? Well, of course, hi. Uh, but but uh, in 2019, I was a visiting scholar. Um, that's part of the Challenges Group and the Amsterdam Research Center on Gender and Sexuality. And so I got to sit in this chair every week and learn um, from all the exciting people who came through. So, so it's fun to be back um, and be working on some new projects. So what I'm presenting today, um, I circulated a paper, which is sort of, I would say, like the first paper from this project. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about that um, and, and that set of hypotheses. But you can think about this project more like a first foray uh, into a new area. So Western has uh, this grant program on interdisciplinary research, um, and you can only apply for it if you've uh, on something you've never worked on before and with somebody you've never worked with before. And so Aaron Heary, who is an associate professor in psychology, and I, uh, when I moved to Western a couple of years ago, like got to talking about some of our, our mutual interests, and we thought getting this grant would be a great way to just like push ourselves to start working. So um, every time I talk about this project or present it, I get like the first question is, yeah, but what are you really trying to test? Like, what do you really? So, so open your minds today, like, like think of what might be possible. So so what we're doing with this is just trying to better understand what happens during face to face political talk. The political scientists in the room and online think about everything you know about political discussion, right? And it usually revolves around online, right? Like, so how do people post online? How do they interact online? Um, are they in echo chambers? They talk with people they disagree with, or there's the um, the political networks literature, right? So who do you discuss politics with? Sort of who's in your political network? And almost all of this is self-report, right? It's almost all like, you know, recall who you, who you talk politics with. Is this person a man or a woman? Do you agree or disagree? Um, or how often do you discuss politics? Um, people use these variables all the time in behavior research, but we don't really know what's happening when people are actually having political conversations. So that's what Aaron and I wanted to do first, is sort of like, what happens to people um, and as director of the body politics lab the way that i think about my research is both the body in politics so um for those of you who know old american pop culture like this is your brain on drugs right like like this is your body on politics okay so i want to know things like um hot pot right like so what the politics that makes us hot right what is the um how might we be stressed how might we be excited motivated etc what are the emotions around um, and how do we bodily experience that and then the other side of the coin which which i won't talk about today um is understanding how things like physical appearance um, like sort of how people perceive you as a body in a political realm. So candidate uh, studies, um, a little bit about we, political we actors. And, and so on. Somebody possibly in Italian doesn't have their. Uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think you're on mute. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people in the chat are saying that you're on mute. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. Oh. 
So Perfect. for friends online, I've said some very profound things about the groundbreaking theory and methods that I'm going to be presenting today. So uh, po we apologize for this. Uh, yes, so in social psychology, they're interested in conversation quality and um, for the purposes of our first paper that's about extroversion uh, and gender and how this uh, these things impact political conversations, um, there's an interesting new paper uh, that finds that when people talk to extroverts, um, they don't feel listened to, so they find it unpleasant, right? Because they're sort of sucking all the air out of the room. But conversely, you can imagine a situation where someone who maybe doesn't enjoy talking very much likes to talk to an extrovert because they kind of carry the conversation. I, I pretend that's how people feel when they talk to me, for example, right? Like I'm just like carrying the load. Um, so this is so coming from that perspective, there aren't a lot of social psychologists. There are lots of social psychologists who study politics, but the people who study these dyadic interactions don't tend to study political questions, right? So there's that contribution. And then on the other side, um, for political scientists, we know that people avoid conflict, right? So one of the reasons they might not want to talk about politics is they're afraid there'll be conflict. Um, a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of what we know is self-report or online kinds of interactions. Um, and then there's, for sort of my interest, this, this idea of gender discussion networks. So um, the research that shows that when men and women choose or talk about their political discussion partners, they both say they talk politics with men. And I have another, I have a separate project I'm working on uh, with political discussion networks where we, we go a step further and we ask people, when you talk about politics with this person, who initiates? And by far, men start talking about politics to women, right? So, so kind of interested, you can imagine in, a, in, a, in an in-person study, how you can capture these dynamics, like who's speaking up first, who's speaking the most, and so on. So these are some of the guiding motivations around, um, and I'll say for the, the online audience, this is an initial exploratory study, um, bringing together social psychology and political science uh, theory uh, and method in, in thinking about how people interact with one another. So uh, our, our basic setup, we have 40 groups of six participants aged uh, 18 to 30. Um, we did recruit on campus. And so if if you want to talk to me about how college students are different than other people and we fine, but like <laughs> um, I will say to head that off, um, I am working right now on a project to expand the study to four countries and with broader adult populations. So you can just save that question, right? So, so we are trying to study more than just university people, although I would argue that university students, we might care about how they talk about politics too. So, so this could be something interesting. Um, for those of you interested in logistics, um, there's a very detailed outline in the paper about how we went through and did this recruiting. Um, you might think, well, if you say, you know, political discussion, you're going to have the self-selection effect. We we told people they would come and have a conversation about a number of uh, topics, and so we listed healthcare, climate change, um, New Year's resolutions, like all these different things. So it wasn't explicitly come talk about politics, right? Um, I'm going to show you in a second an animation that sort of takes us through uh, how how the interactions went. Um, and then the nice thing is uh, after each conversation that people had, um, they had a, a little survey they did. So they'd scan a QR code that's on the screen in the room and they and we'd ask, what did you talk about? Did you feel knowledgeable? Um, did you enjoy the conversation? And then another paper we want to work on can you guess the political ideology of your conversation partner, right? Understanding we have that information from a pre-survey. So uh, a lot uh, of data collected in this. Um, uh, one of the other cool things about this project is Aaron and I are very interested in main effects. So we want to know political versus non-political and we care about the content, but that wasn't as important. So what we did is we let our PhD students populate the study. Um, so each of these questions represents um, either sort of a side interest or a budding interest or a dissertation, uh, a central dissertation topic for our PhD students. So for example, um, I have a student who's working on um, Canadian identity. And so he wants to look at the transcripts from people talking about what does it mean to be a Canadian and do an exploration of like how people talk about these sorts of things. So, so these are all, um, and I'm happy to answer more specific questions about those. And then the non-political topics, um, because we're working with psychologists who get to pick whatever DV they want, I envy this, right? Um, we, we have a series of things that, that they're interested in. Um, although if you want to ask more about the astro astrology zodiac signs, uh, one of my students and I have, have a little bit of a, we have, we have 
we have some ideas around this that we think might be fascinating. So, um, so we want to see how people talk about these other kinds of things. Um, and then I'll show you here how it goes. So this is our lab space. This is the waiting room. Um, and we have three rooms that are outfitted with um, like high tech cameras that move on mechanical arms and we can adjust them from the control room. So people are taller or shorter, et cetera. Participants come in, they're given uh, a name tag and they go first to uh, a room where they complete like the Hexaco personality and just some other kind of non-related um, pre-surveys. In the meantime, our RAs enter each number into um, a Python code that we have that then randomly assigns people once they're in the computer room to go, go to room one, chair one, go to room two, chair three, et cetera. So this is like speed dating, right? This is like round robin style conversations. So you talk to a person, um, the cameras are going, it gives you your topics, and then at the end, you have your QR codes, you, you fill out your quality conversation study, and then it says, ding, 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 you know, participant 101, you move to this room. Participant 102, stay put, right? So, so this is kind of, it's all automated um, uh, in this way. And so this is our control room. So our RAs uh, can be in here making sure, like we've had some cameras break, we've had some other. This week we had wasps in one of our rooms. Um, and so, you know, so, so you have things that you have to deal with um, and, and they're sort of watching from here to, to see what's happening. So I'm just going to show you, this is two of our RAs. Oops. How do I press, oh, there it is. I'm just going to show you what it looks like and I'm not sure if the sound, but you can see this is what we see in um, in the video. A little louder. And well, we're fast. I'm, this is built to fast forward through all these things. So it's giving you a sense of this is how the computers look. They're facing each other, or the videos facing each other. And after watching a few of these, hey. Their initial expressions when the topic comes up is very, very uh, common. They're like, everyone kind of goes, whoa, OK, you know, and they kind of uh, start in on the conversation. Let's go. Oh, this. All right. So so that's sort of how it goes for each interaction and then they move on to the next room. Um, so in this sort of initial exploration of um, <laughs> Sounds like someone's having fun. Um, uh, we're going to explore a number of things. So, of course, just like, uh, and I've conducted focus group studies before. So, just think of the richness of the data in these transcripts. So, understanding how people, um, you know, if, if any of you have designed uh, survey questions and you want to know, like, when someone reads a survey question, like, what do they really a think out loud study, if you will, like Tobias has, has done, uh, we get to sort of see how people puzzle through these questions that we really care about, which I think is interesting. Um, and then if we see sort of something happening in the text, maybe we want to go look at the video to see, okay, how are these people behaving with one another um, uh, in this kind of thing? We also want to, um, for example, we have a, a set of questions on the survey about nature mindedness. So it's this um, this survey battery that's sort of like like I you know I like to be in nature. You know, nature calms me. I'm very connected to nature. Like that sounds very repetitive, but it's these kinds of things. Um, and we want to see if when people are asked to talk about climate change, if the people who scored higher in nature mindedness like a week before. Does that come up when they talk about climate change? Do they say things like, you know, we're not going to have forests anymore. We're not going to, you know, or is, or is it more dedicated to sort of human centric concerns uh, around climate change? So there's a lot we can do with the text analysis. Um, I'm going to show you in a second here the facial micro expressions and emotions um, that we're really interested in. Um, so one of the things that political scientists want to know is, you know, do people enjoy talking about politics? Do they feel stressed out? Do they feel anxious? Um, those of us who study emotion know that people are pretty bad at identifying discrete emotions um, and telling us about them. And so this way we can sort of capture these moments um, uh, of what might be happening when they're asked to talk about uh, political topics. Uh, we can also through um, the 
I guess the high technology uh, cameras that we have, we're able to, to capture capillary dilations so we can look at frame by frame um, heart rate changes. So, um, you know, are these, uh, is this increasing when people talk about politics versus not? Um, and then we're really interested in these other kinds of things like partner interactions. Um, I have a I have a colleague at Western who's who's a time series guy, and he is there any other kind? It's always a time series. Uh, but anyway, so he he was watching this presentation. He's like, you could apply time series to this. He's like, what a person says and does here, you know. And I hadn't thought about it that way, like how exactly we're going to analyze, uh, because none of these variables are independent, right? So everything that I do is dependent on what you do. And so thinking about how, you know, to sort of model these things, I think is gonna be a really interesting challenge um, for us going forward. So uh, what Noldis Face Reader does, and there, and there are other um, face reading technologies uh, available, uh, is, it, is it generally, you know, analyzes these um, movements in the face and then classifies them in these sort of blunt categories. And then you can go in and hand code on top of that. So you could have uh, a person go in and say, you know, oh, there was a smile, there was a grimace, there was a, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, and so what I'm gonna show you today is just basically positive and negative valence. I'm not gonna assign an emotion to it. I'm just gonna show, you know, um, given how much a person's facial expression changes when their standard deviation above their own average positively we're going to talk about that as a positive valence and then and then a negative valence so you can see kind of how this how this gets coded across uh, each of these things there we go so these are two actual participants who spoke with one another and you can see across um the x-axis is the introduction like you know hi i'm amanda this is what i do um the apolitical conversation and political of course you can see much more positive during the, the non-political conversation uh, than the political. Of course, when you think about it, even if, if someone really cares about politics, it's serious, right? So you're going to have a more serious face. Like you're not going to be like, climate change, oops, right? Like this isn't going to, I mean, that would be interesting if someone did, um, but, but, but it's sort of unsurprising. But we want to know sort of these differences relative to, to one another. And so you can kind of see, um, you know, that the participant uh, K226, uh, you know, uh, was a lot more negative in the in the introduction than P223, right? So we can see these sort of individual level things. And then um, this is another way of looking at it. So this is one uh, complete group. So a round robin group who's at the lab at the same time. And it's kind of interesting to look at. So again, the, the darker shades are more positive affect in their facial expressions or facial behavior. And so, of course, it's it's darker during non-political versus political conversations, but you can look, um, you know, when one person talks to a variety of other people. So like G two two two, you know, it was very positive when talking to themselves. No, sorry, <laughs> uh, but you know, you can see like so what was happening or like what if they're positive with everybody, but then with someone they weren't, right? So we can kind of do this like interesting exploration of digging in was there political disagreement there or sort of this. Um, uh, uh, inductive way of, of thinking about what, what these kind of facial expressions might be telling us about what's going on. Some preliminary uh, evidence we think is that when people are showing more positive affect, um, their partners have a harder time predicting their ideology. And when people are showing more negative affect, uh, they seem to get it right, right? So, and again, preliminary, we're still, I, I haven't analyzed the data from this week, um, just, just sort of up until now. But we wonder if there might be something going on where very agreeable people might just be nodding along with, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. But and so then the other person doesn't know their true views. Right. So when are you obscuring your views, et cetera? Uh, so the first paper um, follows on some work, uh, actually a paper with Isabella Rovasso, who is a alumni almost of, of this lab, um, or she and I were looking at the effect of extroversion and gender on um, the pleasantness of, of politics. So why, if people like political acts, et cetera, and a lot of evidence from personality uh, studies have said or found that extroversion sort of predicts general um, engagement with politics, right? So probably the facet of enthusiasm um, and so on might, might be related, but I think it's probably a bit more complicated than that. So 
Um, so we're interested in looking at whether extroverted men. So in some of my other work, I found that extroverted men just love politics, love everything about I'll post online, I'll sign a petition, I'll go to a thing and extroverted women a little bit less so, right? So so extroversion isn't providing that like extra lean in uh, sort of thing that would you know provide resources for women to get more engaged. So we want to look specifically um, whether or not uh, when people talk to extroverted men and women, are they reacting differently than to introverts um, and so on? So that's kind of the first first thing that we're going to take a look at. So uh, in our sample of young Canadians, there is no relationship between interest in politics and extroversion. So maybe unsurprising, um, but that's kind of the first thing to notice that we have and, and some kind of uh, interesting variation um, uh, within these groups. If we take a look at, and this is just, we split extroversion and, in, and political interest into thirds, um, and this is just kind of for visualization to think about the sorts of comparisons we can make. Um, when people introduce themselves, uh, you know, you can see that they have more positive affect than when they talk about politics, right? Um, even for people who are high in extroversion, right? So it isn't the case that, like the theory, um, you know, if pol if when politics are social, extroverts will love it, right? Like this sort, and there are there's assumptions like this written into certain political science uh, theories on Big Five, uh, but you can see that that's not necessarily the case. That they're de definitely demonstrating more positive affect during these non-political conversations than they are here, and there are these sort of gender differences, right? Where um, actually women extroverts are showing um, more positive affect than men are. Another way to look at it: uh, people low in extroversion, and so you can if you just look at this chart, right? People low in extroversion, less positive affect in having any conversation, right? So, so introverts, um, you know, are a little uh, perhaps less interested. We paid $30, uh, which is very, like, I mean, Canadian, so like two, $2 US, really. <laughs> that's just a little currency joke. Um, but but thirty dollars is like very like that's a, that's a highly paid study on campus. So um, even I think we got some introverts came and did our study too, right? For the money. Um, <laughs> So, so you can see, so these are people just medium political interest, right? And sort of these differences um, along extroversion by men and women. Um, and then again, like people who are really interested in politics, um, still, it's not like there's these sort of positive facial expressions when they're talking about them, but I think it's because politics is this serious uh, uh, kind of enterprise, and maybe that's what's occurring. Um, I thought I'd show you, this is so, this is just so basic um, at this point, right? So um, for people, when they express a standard deviation above their average facial expressions, positive and standard below negative, uh, during the question about uh, should there be more women in government among men, there really wasn't a, a big difference. Um, you know, they kind of showed like similar uh, sorts of uh, emotional valence, but women were much more likely to have a positive valence, right? And this is statistically significant. So we're starting to see among topic areas, we might have uh, something going on. Climate change, same thing. Um, women were much more expressive. Of course, if any of you have studied uh, gender presentation and expression and these kinds of things, we are socialized to smile and you know make sure everyone feels great, right? So, so this could be that kind of effect that's happening, right? We don't know if it's because um, you know, uh, women are just like really excited, and enthusiastic. This is where looking at the transcripts and maybe looking at the videos can give us more information. Um, and then finally, um, we're talking about uh, Canadian identity. Um, this was a much more positive um, uh, sort of interaction. And so this is where you do kind of see a, a bit of the differences within genders um, as well as between. So, so just kind of a, a, a first cut at this. Of course, I'm, there's no in conclusion. Um, here's what I think it all means because I don't know yet, right? Like so, so we're still. You know, we collected an entire you know round of data um, in the spring. It took us four or five weeks to get twenty to twenty four groups of six, and we have now done twenty groups in one week in the fall. So pro tip. If you're running on campus studies, people are real excited in the fall. Like they're mm -hmm. they're back and they're ready to go. And in the spring, everyone's very tired. <laughs> and so I yeah, so I, so it'll be interesting to see if there are some differences. And it was cold um, when we were doing, you know, uh, these kinds. So, yeah, thinking about these um, uh, temporal and contextual effects might be interesting as as we take a look at these things. Uh, so yeah, with that, um, I'll end and I'm happy to take yeah any kind of questions or comments if you want to make suggestions on um, 
a cool way you think to look at the data. Uh, I, I would love to hear that if you want to know more about something specific to the project. Um, yeah, open to anything. So thank you. I believe I was exactly at 25 minutes. Yeah, thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. So now we will uh, open the floor for some questions. Um, uh, so uh, you mentioned that when people were more smiled more or showed more emotional, uh, positive emotional valence, that others were less likely to accurately guess or they were less accurate in guessing the other person's ideological position. Uh, does, but is it because they are guessing that the other person is similar to them? Um, because maybe they're sugarcoating whenever they disagree with the person and so on. Yeah. Uh, is that it? Oh, I'm saying, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, so, so um, that uh, exploratory comment was we took a look at a group of six and we just kind of grabbed what were their um, their ideologies, like their self-reported ideology and, and what were uh, the ide ideology that they were rated upon by their partners. And in that group of six, there was this pattern that people who had more negative expression um, uh, their partner was able to more accurately guess. We haven't looked at the transcripts, right? Because that's what you'd want to do, right? Is you'd want to see, okay, when they're talking about climate change, if they say that they're left wing, are, are their words matching what they rate, right? And so that's what we need to do is like look at what is this expression? Yeah, but but yeah, so I want to be very, very cautious that we think that might be something that could be happening, but we're not sure. Thank you so much for the good presentation. Uh, I think uh, it's really excellent that you have real humans talking to each other, yeah. and just uh, looking at you know what they post online or just interactions that are in person. It's it's yeah amazing resource of data. And in relation to that, I have a question about um, how much interest you have in the literature on deliberation. So we have run studies during COVID without actual interactions uh, between persons. We were trying to study whether people engage in deliberation with a deliberate partner uh, when they are from the uh, opposite groups. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the, well, mm -hmm. the, they are not from the same group. Like uh, like a party or like what was? It was a party. I okay, guess we yeah. Signal. Uh, the other thing that we tried to get at was whether there was a conflict in the views that they have. So mm -hmm. hypothesis that was, well, it was not supported, but that if you are from the same group, actually you have uh, more space to deliberate with the person when you disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we measured what kind of deliberate style they would prefer, so whether they would engage, whether they would arguments. And I think you have excellent data to see exactly yeah. this kind of thing. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. What what country did you do this in? Living in Poland. In Poland. And okay. It was migration. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. I think one of the things we want to do. Um, so my my student Jesse, who's working on Canadian identity, uh, we actually have a very nice um, uh, mix uh, of of racial ethnic groups in this um, in this sample, and so he's really interested in looking at when you share a racial mm -hmm. ethnic group, um, the way you talk about Canadian identity, if that's different than if you don't, mm -hmm. um, and if two Anglo Canadians, for example. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about Canadian identity. Do they bring up things like multiculturalism and sort of the, you know, the that's the Canadian line in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, or don't they? Right. And, and of course, there's a few. Of course, someone's like, oh, Tim Hortons hockey. Like, you know, this is. <laughs> Uh, and, and so and so we're interested in that kind of thing. And so it's not quite like the opposite group, but that's the sort of the, yeah. the group thing. Um, Canada is a being a political psychologist in Canada is really fascinating because you don't. Like partisanship is not like I'm American and it's just night and day, right? Right. And so you don't so already young people's partisan identities, you could talk a bit about this, but but certainly in Canada, you don't have those same sort of uh, uh, I think group identities at work there. Um, but we could maybe look at something like if people do self-identify with the new Democratic Party or the Conservative Party, and then when they talk, you know, to one another, I will tell you, um, uh, you know, people kind of ask like, well, how realistic is this? Like, don't they notice the cameras? And they really forget the cameras are there. Um, and in in the question about whether women should be in government or not, we actually had a participant say, no, they're too emotional. Like like a 21 year old person said this. Right. And I think everyone's like, oh, everyone's beyond that. It's like, no, 
people also have no problem just saying it, right? And so, and, and it was a man who was speaking to a woman who, who said, no, I think they're too emotional. So um, so we have these kind of interesting moments of, of, of conflict and tension that I think, uh, you know, maybe through some sort of like text analysis or topic modeling, um, we could maybe see like sort of when these these sort of flips or turns are happening. Um, or I really like the work of when, so there's a political scientist, Aaron Rossiter, who does work on uh, when people change change the subject, kind of like when the topic changes. And I think that would be interesting too, to see when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm interested in, um, you said that generally it's known that women bring up politics less than, than men do. And now with your forced choice role for well, like forced topic forward, I think we have like the opportunity to really explore why that is the case, right? And immediately I can think of basically three things that maybe it's um intimidation. They don't, they just don't want to engage in the topic at all and feel maybe not equipped or maybe not knowledgeable enough. Or it's fatigue, they just feel like, oh, okay, here we go again, I don't want to do this. Or like, do they not want to risk having an unfavored stance and sharing that? But then as soon as you get talking to it, they actually are really happy to engage with it. So then with you forcing the conversation into this topic. What do you think you're going to find? Like, what do you, how do you think these, especially male and female interactions yeah. are going to go? Yeah. Well, so I think, yeah, so I think we can do this, this interesting temporal thing, right? So um, when we were doing the project design, we, uh, we went back and forth about whether we would assign who speaks first, right? So if we, so if the topic comes up and we're like, okay, you know, participant 101, you open the floor or something, but then we decided, and, and maybe, Maybe if we had to do it again, we'd half of them we'd do that to and other half not, right? Um, but we had this opportunity to see like when the when the political topic comes up, who jumps in first, right? Versus when the non-political topic comes up, is is that a bit different? And I will kind of clarify on the um women talking, bring up politics. That tends to be uh, when they're uh, talking to um men discussion partners. So I have another paper where we asked people to name their most important problem facing the country. Um, and then we asked, we piped that in and said, who do you talk about this issue with? Because um, I think another problem with asking people about if they talk about politics is when people hear politics, I think they think elections, candidates, the economy, foreign policy or something like this. And so if, if any of you are aware of the, um, the political knowledge literature about how men and women sometimes know different things about politics, I think the same thing happens with this too, right? So so I think maybe when women are talking to women, you're gonna, you know, uh, you might have less of this reluctance, but also women are so socialized to avoid conflict and to make sure everybody feels okay, that, you know, I think that would be at work in a lot of these settings, yeah. yeah. Okay, then there is also some questions online. Uh, so the first one is from Diamantes from the American College of Greece, asking um, about the facial expression recognitions of prayer and if it can differentiate between ironic and literal smiling expressions. Could it be that females use smiling to convey a different meaning, like dislike in a socially acceptable manner than simply positive balance? So the first thing I should caveat is that this is a new area. So I, I have a background in physiology and, and um, other kinds of um, uh, in-person data collections. And, and Aaron is definitely the expert and I'm, I'm sort of learning along the way. But from my understanding, like the natural smile is the only thing we really know. Like I think the natural smile where, you're, where your eyes kind of crinkle, like there's a picture of, of Jun Su. Um, actually, uh, sent him an email and was like, is it OK that I'm showing this photo around the world um, there? Right. His eyes are closed. And he's got like that. Nap, you know, so that's kind of um, what I understand this, the. The thing we know for sure, but everything else is very difficult to tell. Right. So I've I've also tried to work with EMG um, data and it's always I mean, Heiss and I have lamented EMG studies for many years because it's always so messy. Um, you know about what's going on, but, but I think that's right. And, and I think maybe the hope with this is that um, between the transcripts and um, and the facial expressions, uh, you know, if we have like the heart rate capture, I'm not sure if it can get at irony, uh, but uh, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I think that's yeah, I think that's really valid. And, and I think that's a pretty open. Um, I think that's an open question. I think that's I'm excited to keep doing like this is my first 
study on this. And I think there's so many questions that, that we could answer with it. So um, so if he has ideas, he should let me know. <laughs> Just make one point like my um, One cool thing to do here, besides the ironic smile, which would be different, is maybe see if the lips, so the lip corner polar, if that changes. Yeah. But if the the eye, so the the eyes closed and the cheek razor, if those don't change, because mm. that that's often like the the, the more polite smile. Right. The sardonic grin. Yes. Yeah, right. And, right. And, you know, people often use this when they don't really agree. So yeah, and that's a way to go. So. Well, if someone else is first, then. OK, well, uh, then first, uh, again, the chat um, from Matthijs. Um, our Matthijs, your Matthijs. Yes. Uh, our Matthijs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I also have one small question, but please let people in the room. <laughs> first, I might have missed it, but do you ask questions in the survey preceding the talks about empathy slash reflect? perspective taking mm -hmm. that might be an interesting moderator for many of the research questions. Yeah, that's really that's a really good um, suggestion. I'm trying to think through. So we have a pre survey um, uh, that they that they have to take and they can't schedule the lab um, portion until five days from that point. Then they take the hexaco and and I think within the hexaco they have. There'd be humility, I guess. Yeah. Not quite empathy, agreeableness. There's a, yeah, maybe there's some, maybe there's some items among those that could have uh, empathy, but I don't think that we have that. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I will look into if we have any items that could approximate <laughs> empathy. Cool idea. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is fantastic work. Um, hard to think of what I've seen this. It's the second time I've seen this. So. But I think uh, I think last time you said what are you what are you trying to test? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, as well. A lot of frowning. <laughs> What's your dependent still, variable? Still curious. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. So yes. Uh, now I I particularly wanted to ask you what specifically how does the heart rate registration measurement work, and and what are your intentions with it? Also thinking about how differently this is going to be used. Mm -hmm. Well, so the so the thing the only when I think about political science literature, I think about um, that Jamie Settle and Taylor Carlton I think it's opting out is their paper, right? And um, they, they're kind of looking at social anxiety and and sort of how people obviously if they have social anxiety they opt out of politics, but the um, uh, folks are hooked up to physiology and. Uh, are told that they're going to have to have a, a conversation with someone from, I think, a political opposite or an opposite partisan group. And just the idea, just being told this, increases, right? Right? Their their um, uh, their heart rate and and sort of shows the, this kind of nervousness. But then, you know, they weren't able in the study to, you know, actually have the conversation. And so I was kind of thinking about this. Um, uh, some ideas around how, like, when the political topic comes up. Or is there sort of a different pattern than um, than when another one does? Someone actually gave me the idea. They're like, okay, if you have the political topic first, and then when the non-political topic comes up, they might be so relieved that you know. So there might be a change that happens there um, that you could take a look at. And so I, I haven't seen what the data looks like when it comes out of of this program. The remote. Less a smography, like, what's that word, you know? The this, yes. Um, but it, yeah, the capillary dilation, and it's just frame by frame. So I don't, I don't have, um, what I would like to do is I'm in the process of um, purchasing wearables for my lab, and I'd like to do this again and just have more precise physiological measurements to kind of look at um, arousal during these different things. And I think it would, I think it's gonna be different for different people, right? Um, so if you, don't care about climate change you know that's going to have less you know you're going to have less of a response than if it's something you feel really passionate about and i bet like when the, um should more women be in government question you're going to see some gender differences in you know even if the women who are having to answer this don't feel strongly about it uh, they're preparing themselves to hear something like we know that oh boy great right um and this is one of the one of the um when we are choosing topics 
at least for this first study, we didn't choose anything about immigration, um, about um, trans rights or, or something like like from an ethical point of view, I didn't want a participant to be in a situation to have to argue for their own rights um, in in that regard. And also, yeah, I I want to think more about how to approach those um, those sorts of topics, but. Definitely. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Again, like, yeah, I also think this is a great project. Like, I mean, there's going to be so much uh, interesting stuff that's going to come out of it, and, and I really look forward to everything. But I have a bit of an annoying question, <laughs> maybe, um, in that I, this is so much, and there's so much data, and it's like, there's a big thing, it's like a bit overwhelming almost. So I wonder how, how you will, but then, but, but, so that inspire reading like, okay, yes, there we go. But also it provides an opportunity to because you can test everything in a way, right? You can test everything almost in 10 ways and then like cut the data and all of that. So I was being, yeah, just wondering how you think about you know, enormous amount of data, yeah. exploratory analysis, and then also like how are you gonna yeah, uh, ensure that you're not uh, I don't know. Yeah, that that doesn't go wrong. Right, right. Um, yeah, we're slicing and dicing and, you know, julianning that just American infomercial joke <laughs> for the olds out there um, like me. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I and I think this is another reason why it was a, it was just like a really easy decision to let our graduate students um uh, populate the content right so so for example you know a lot of the transcripts they're just going to take um and uh and use for their dissertations right so like so maybe um uh do like a, a qualitative coding analysis of the way that people talk about um identity and then use that to inform a survey experiment they might run later right so it'll be like part one of a chapter of, of something like this um and so uh so one practical thing is like within different domains um, each of the students sort of have. Uh, so one of the questions was about uh, social media influencers and our psychology grad student. That's what she's working on is influencer culture and so on. So she's going to sort of take that and maybe she'll look a bit at the facial expressions. Um, but she, they're, they're going to start with the transcripts, right? So they're going to start with uh, this kind of thing. Erin um, and I, you know, we're kind of thinking of sort of three big papers that have more to just do with like what do, we, what do we do with this sort of data? Like, how can we think about um, so some methods papers about what are the best ways to sort of model? I think she wants to do some Markov chain. Um, I don't really I'm like you do that uh, kinds of stuff. I'm fascinated by this time series idea. I actually really want to think about, um, you know, how that might work. There's actor partner independence model things that you can do with these sort of dyadic. But we want to look sort of this like very broad view of political and non-political topics. You know what's happening with the facial expressions and maybe look a little and just let our students use those and i think that makes it kind of a lot more manageable um and it isn't like we're trying to i don't forgive the term but like make sauce like making sausage right we're just like churning out you know all this stuff from from the same data and uh some of this is going to be pilot data for these grants that we're applying to as well so um i think the next time we do this it'll be way less exploratory it's gonna it's gonna look a lot more like what you're talking about where we're sort of trying to solve a problem or, or bring people together in a certain kind of way and not just let's throw some strangers in a room and see what happens which is kind of exactly what this is right and so yeah yeah from the introduction you mentioned that you love approaches are about creating conversation yeah so my question would be um, like, what is your base on level? Do people actually enjoy the conversations? Do mm. they expect to enjoy mm. them? And what factors, maybe specifically for the political discussions, yeah. um, predict their enjoyment of the conversation? Yeah, so we've had a lot of cases of people changing numbers um, after the event. <laughs> like, uh, not, uh, and I mean, maybe romantically, I don't know, I didn't ask, but um, but no, like people who just like genuinely had fun and enjoyed themselves and like it was a way to sort of meet people on campus and different things. And so there's um, like my RAs have said that it's just like this general sort of uh, enjoyment of it, um, which I think is really lovely to think about like in light of the deliberation um, uh, literature. And, and when we think about how can we bring people together who 
might be afraid to talk about certain kinds of things, but once they actually get started, it's fine. Um, Barrett and I were actually talking about this uh, this yesterday on, on some of the projects um, that he's working on that we expect that they're going to be very vitriolic and yet, you know, people find this common ground. And so I think that's really nice. Um, but I do think there's going to be. There were people who weren't afraid to say controversial things. And so whether or not. And again, this is why this as like an open science pre registration person, I'm about to say, I don't know, we'll just kind of dig around, right? But it's like sort of like, look, you know, look at the facial expressions first and sort of what are the patterns there and then see what's being talked about or go to um, the surveys and see, okay, people who are really low on disagreeableness, what did people look like when they were talking to these people, right? Like sort of, um, so I think there's a lot of different ways. And then, you know, from that, of course, we would want to test that. Uh, you know, so to so Daphna's comment about replication, so we would want to you know, sort of use this as a way to generate hypotheses to then, you know, test at a future point. But generally speaking, people um, enjoyed their selves, themselves. Uh, building off of uh, what Jacob said, um, and forgive me if this is a bit of a Mickey Mouse kind of question, but, uh, but are there any plans to expand this to uh, small group settings? Is that the thought is that you know um, how people are going to respond is uh, perhaps conditioned by the company that they might think that they're in. So people who think that they're a mixed company, for example, might be a little bit more reticent to engage. And so they see that there are other people that are talking, and so they, they kind of withdraw a bit. Yeah, yeah, and it, and you have more opportunities. You're not on the hot seat, as it were, if there's other people in the room. So I have, um, I did uh, some focus group studies about 10 years ago, I guess, uh, um, with religious groups. And it was interesting, we actually chose um, like groups that already existed. So like a Bible study or a Sunday school class or something like this. Um, and you saw these dynamics at play. And we asked them sort of like, uh, what is the role of faith in politics? What is, you know, like these sort of broad questions and sort of who spoke for the group and, you know, like, um, I almost felt like I knew these groups after two hours, like, oh, I bet I know how this goes each week, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, and so that, yeah, so that was really interesting I mean, fascinating. And I, and I wonder, um, the other kind of question related to what you're saying that people have asked me is what about doing this with people who know each other, right? So um, with families, right? So how, and, and one of the things I'd love to do um, in our lab space, we have a, a relationship psychologist who, uh, Last year, her study was going on with ours and couples were coming in and there was a bit of we're like, no, 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 those couples aren't supposed to be in the conversation study. They're supposed to, you know, but I would love to do to to um, to sort of partner together and see this kind of study. So you have these couples in to do whatever she wants, you know, the my colleague wants to study, but then you throw in a, a political topic and sort of see like what happens in, in those circumstances or you could do it with families um, and so on. But I think that would be really interesting. No plans as of yet. Someday. Yeah. Um, this is super interesting. Uh, I have a question about just kind of if everyone's just kind of vibing during these talks, and uh, do you do see certain drops in in affect, right? And it would be super interesting to kind of go back to the text and see what is responsible for the drops. Yeah. What creates negative effect here? And do you, do you have an idea? Or have you have you looked at this already a bit? And are there differences between the political and non-political drops? So what yeah. causes negative effect in that case? Yeah, I mean, I have some idiosyncratic examples. So um, we had a the question about what do you think of astrology and zodiac signs? Um, there was one dyad. It was it was two young men. Uh, it it came up on the screen, and one looked at it, and he's like it's bullshit and the other one's like uh-huh and then like then they just like moved on to this other sort of topic um and so we kind of have these examples so probably in that moment there was kind of this sort of drop and then they kind of got back to um to the introducing um the other example i can kind of think of is we're in the lab we're calling it the timothy chalamet effect <laughs> you're welcome um so uh we had a uh we had a participant who resembled a certain uh, <laughs> actor, um, but was also just very um, charming and agreeable and dynamic. And the the PhD students were just like sort of watching the magic happen across the screens. Like if you went to the room with him, like 
like everyone's lighting up and so on. He's making you feel whatever. But then you go to the next person and it's sort of just like, wah, wah. like but just like each person, men and women, just enjoyed talking to him and all this sort of stuff. And like it was just like this incredible sort of to watch it, watch it happen. So I think you have these, and this gets at Josh's question, like when people are in a group and sort of create a situation that makes people feel um, you know, welcome and and listened to and that kind of thing. Um we also we had a number of psychology students who are very suspicious. They think everything is deception. Mm -hmm. um, so because of the way uh, groups are randomly assigned, so um, you know I complete the survey and then I say, oh, you know I'll go Tuesday at two o'clock, and then when two o'clock fills, we close it. Right? We don't look at who's coming. We just do this. So sometimes we've had one man and five women. Can imagine with it. So after after the end of the study, uh, the the one man in the group was like, "I know what you're doing here. <laughs> you're seeing what happens when a man has to talk to women about like, like he's like, I see what this is." And the RAs were like, "Seriously, dude, no. Like it really this is just a coincidence. Like you can see the next group's coming in. It's mixed." And he's like. <laughs> you know, like he was convinced, and I think they were trying to figure out sort of like what the study was. And like, it literally is what it is. Just we just want you to talk to people. That's all. It's all, like we swear this is all it is. You know, um, so we've kind of had these interesting things where I think people are trying to game like what it is that's going on. And I think I don't know how we'll capture that exactly, but um, yeah, I yeah I think that will be kind of uh, fascinating. I, the other thing I'll mention is another one of my students is interested in. Uh, uh, physical appearance um, kinds of kinds of things. And so she wants to take a look at presentation. So, uh, you know, are people, um, you know, are, is their hair up or down? Um, are they wearing, like, are they kind of dressed a little bit more nicely? Or are they kind of in sweats? Like, is there kind of, and is there an effect? And again, as an exploratory, you know, uh, for, to build on for her dissertation, but to think about, you know, do people rate conversation quality? So this kind of like dress for the job that you want idea, or people will treat you better at the airport if you dress well, or like these things that we always hear, like do somehow people interact with folks who are a bit more dressed up differently? Um, unfortunately, like 90% of students came in in like roots hoodies and like, I mean, this, this is Canada, like uh, in in uh, in April. So there might not be enough variation, but she kind of wants to look at this sort of like male, female gaze and like different things about appearance presentation to see if that kind of can impact the, the interaction. Yeah, um, just thinking about this, if you're already making, or making up the name Timothy Chalamet effect, mm. then probably like if you're actively looking for this effect because it's so obvious, then probably this will attract you. Right, um, right, plays a role in there, right? Yeah, like if you're intuitively naming it, it's probably relevant. Um, but I was also wondering, is there any way of you pre and post testing ideology and political orientation? Because I'm always interested in the, like failed contact hypothesis because you intuitively think, oh, just get people with different orientations to talk about topics, and then this will like drive all this understanding and it will be a lot much more centralized than, than before. Yeah, and often that fails. So, is there anything that you're pre and post testing where you can check for this? So you're checking basically what was your right. before and after, and did you write anyone of a different opinion? Maybe even how did that conversation go for you? And then do we have this phenomenon again where afterwards you actually more radicalized? It doesn't mean we have to be radicalized, mm -hmm. but like even more prone to your own stance. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, first of all, I don't think that ever works. Um, so I think like contact theory, like there's you know, um yeah, we have. So one of the things I think is interesting is in the ratings, we have something where um, how similar do you think you are to another person? So this gets at kind of your earlier question. Um, so how similar? And then, you know, what do you think their ideology was? Would you want to talk to them again? Now I'm forgetting if we asked, would you be friends with this person? We debated that. I can't remember. Um, and then I think our final set of questions, we maybe ask ideology again um, uh, in some ways. So we can kind of look at five days ago you know, versus sort of that, but understanding they've talked to five people. Yeah. This, I mean, there's a lot like going on with that, right? So you can't, um, that's the other thing. Those of you who enjoy thinking about how to model stuff. Okay, so in your first conversation, you talk to this person who you disagree with, politics was first, non-politics second. Then after whatever happened in that, then you go to the next room. So how do you model how this experience predicts, the next experience predicts the next, like it's, Definites. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure how much of that we can do or how much I even think that we'll find an effect because of, you know, how much is going on and whether people are really taking. Um, I think there'd have to be a very like 
Like, I'm going to go look after the woman who heard women are too emotional. I want to know what happens in the room next, right? Like, so so in some of these instances where there's something like a pretty stark uh, comment to see if, you know, what happens maybe after that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want to know how often Justin Trudeau comes up. Like, do people, <laughs> like, does their, you know, uh, yeah, does their corrugators or zygomat, like, what what is a... Uh, um, what's happening when they talk about these political figures. Um, again, Canada is such an interesting um, case because you don't, yeah, so. We still have two minutes left. If anyone has a small burning question that they still want to ask? Otherwise... Very super small. Yeah. <laughs> um, from a linguistic perspective, there are, there's some evidence showing that there's gender differences in kind of the, the, the style of speaking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, simple things like, women asking more questions or using more hedges when they speak. Yeah. Is this anything that you, you're planning on analyzing? Or? Yeah, um, I'm so glad you asked. I'm actually working on a project uh, with Isabella uh, and Marika Vandervelden um, uh, where we're looking at uncertainty speech um, in parliaments uh, at the moment, but it's this sort of like the tag questions like, um, uh, uh, yeah, climate, it's getting bad, isn't it? Right, like, or whether you make declarative statements. So we're doing that more in kind of a formal setting, um, but we are kind of working on a model that I think we could adapt to something like this. Um, there's some evidence in uh, in the linguistics literature that because I think we think about normatively, or maybe not normatively, evaluatively. I think we think uncertainty is bad. Like, oh, it's bad that women are uncertain and men are certain because then, you know, they're thought of as less knowledgeable. But there's evidence to show uh, that uncertainty invites conversation. So if I say, wow, the planet is burning, isn't it? Right. Then you engage with me. But if I say the planet is burning, then we are done. Right. And so and so there's this thing like like by adding this uncertainty speech, you're inviting people to talk to you. And then that's, uh, you know, so I think that's I think it's fascinating to think about like what. I mean, I don't think we need to put a value on it, but but this sort of interesting bit, like how do people use um, these different forms of speech uh, to either keep conversations going or to or to shut them down? Yeah. And okay, then uh, I'm closing the session and thank you again so much for presenting your super interesting research. And then as every hot politics, <laughs> you get your cup. I lost my other one. I'm very happy to be reunited. So. Yeah, thank you. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks everyone online. <laughs>